Welcome to this broadcast of the Gifted Education Program Requirements. This is a design for district leadership, so superintendents, assistant superintendents, curriculum coordinators, fed directors, principals, um, <coughs> gifted teachers, gifted contact persons. This, we're really going to talk about the nuts and bolts of gifted education. My name is Jen Cornett, and I am the gifted education specialist for the Mississippi Department of Education. I have been in this role for about two and a half years, and it is my honor to be able to support our gifted programs on behalf of the agency. We're going to start with the vision and the mission. Our vision is to create a world-class educational system that gives students the knowledge and skills to be successful in college and the workforce and to flourish as parents and citizens. And our mission, which will allow us to com to meet that vision, is to provide leadership through the development of policy and accountability systems so that all students are prepared to compete in the global community. In Gifted, we see these this mission really come to life because our regulations and standards are our policies, and then our, our three-year Gifted Education Program monitoring that happens regularly is um, a great example of an accountability system. We have a strategic plan with six six goals that guide our work. Goal one is that all students are proficient in showing growth in all assessed areas. Goal two is that every student graduates from high school and is ready for college and career. Goal three is that every child has access to a high quality early childhood program. Goal four is every school has effective teachers and leaders and that's what brings us together today. Goal five is that every community effectively uses a world-class data system to improve student outcomes. And goal six is that every school and district is rated a C or higher. So our first point this morning is to talk about gifted contact persons. This is a role that is required by our regulations. Each district should have two gifted contact persons that are registered with my office one of those two people needs to be endorsed in gifted and have experience in the gifted education program. And the other person can be um, have an administrative role in the district or it can be an additional gifted teacher. This role is important because this, they serve as a liaison between the local districts and the MDE. They work closely with me and are really my point of contact in the district. Often this gifted contact person serves as a lead teacher for the gifted program in places where there's more than one teacher, although that's something that is ultimately up to the district. It is really important to remember that this person does communicate a lot and that we really rely on them to be that liaison. So in choosing someone, you want someone who has knowledge and experience. Oftentimes, districts will leave the management of the program up to the gifted contact persons to assure that everything is being followed down to the letter and then I work with them to make sure that that's happening as well. So it is, it's a very important role. If your district has not um, registered two gifted contact persons for this year, you can do that by sending their names and email addresses to me and my information will be at the end of the broadcast. So now we're going to talk about gifted student identification requirements. This is how students go from referral to placement within the gifted program. So it's important to remember that all referrals must be accepted from anyone. The language in our regulation says anyone can be referred to the gifted education program at any time by anyone. We actually look for that language in district policies. Uh, every year at one grade level, all children must be screened. This is first grade screening or mass and universal screening. It is required by our regulations. And the reason for that is we have to prove that everyone has the opportunity to be identified as being gifted. And that's how we, we do that through universal screening. Parents must give permission to test. That is That happens at different times depending on if it's mass screening or if it's an individual referral. Those guidelines are within regulations. And it's, it is very, very important to note that students cannot be denied referral to the gifted education program based on their academic success. 
Um, really, referrals should not be denied at any time unless there is um, a lot of documentation, d- documentation and justification. But there is this idea that intellectually gifted children are advanced academically, and that's not always true. So it's, it is a, a big note to realize that students cannot be denied referral just because of their academic success. Referrals um, require multiple measures. We have an objective measure, which is the screener. That is what's given to all individual referrals and through mass screening. Typically, those measures are the RAVENS, the OLSAT, or the NNAT. Um, The RAVENS and the NNAT are both nonverbal. The OLSAT does have a verbal component, although there is um, additional measures that may be used in your district. Then we have our subjective measure, which is a teacher checklist. That is the GRS, the GES, or the SIGS, and sometimes those are given to parents instead of teachers, but this is just um, a subjective indicator of potential gifted characteristics. And then the ultimate assessment measure is the IQ test, which is the individual assessment. In most of our districts, the Reynolds 2 or the RIAS 2 is the most popular assessment that's used, although right now some of our psychometrists report that they feel that it is a little hard for older students to get the, the to be identified using the Reynolds 2, but there are a list of um, There's a list available through the Mississippi Association of Gifted Children that shares all of the possible assessments that can be given to determine IQ. As you are identifying children, it is a requirement that all identification materials are kept in a locked storage facility in individual student files. This is important because this information is protected by FERPA and parents have a right to that information at any time. The identification information, including the assessment report, should not be placed in the cumulative folder. Again, this is private information. It should be kept separately. The one thing that should be in the CUM record is the GPPDS, which stands for Gifted Personnel People Data Sheet. And that is the official eligibility form that allows us to serve students. A copy of it can be placed in the cumulative folder so that as students move from school to school or district to district, it serves as an identification. Now that we've talked about how we get students from referral to placement into the program, I want to talk just a minute about the characteristics of gifted learners. It's very important to know that Gifted learners are actually defined by asynchronous development. That means that their brain develops differently from other brains, and often, although they may have advanced areas of um, critical thinking or creativity, they may have areas that need support. It's like their social-emotional skills um, and sometimes their academic support. So when we know that gifted children's brains have developed differently, then we know that they need supports in the educational setting. In Mississippi, we serve intellectual and creative students within our intellectually gifted uh, programs. So our intellectual students are curious. They have complex, abstract ideas. They make zany connections. They can be very intense, intense in their passions and intense in their emotions. They seem to always know and they guess well. They can look at things from multiple points of view and they are very, very original. Sometimes having a conversation with an intellectually gifted student feels like you're talking a foreign language because they approach the world in such a unique way, and that does differ from child to child. Our creatively gifted children, they wonder, they, these are the children who may seem as if they're off task or daydreaming, when in truth, it, they're really thinking constantly, their brain is always going, they're considering things. They have lots of ideas, they're constantly improvising. These are the students who never finish, they're always toying with ideas and playing with concepts or, or pursuing an interest. These children are intuitive. 
They question mastery. These students can be hard to motivate because they don't have any interest in being an expert in any one field. They like to know just enough about everything. And they have um, lots of bizarre ideas and they play with concepts. So it's important to realize that our students have characteristics that may not fit what people assume gifted children look like. We know from research that when asked to refer students for the gifted program, a lot of people see it as a privilege, although it's not. It is an entitlement under the law in our state, but they see it as a privilege, and so they recommend students for placement who are reflections of themselves, and so they tend to look for students who are organized and make good grades and have no behavior problems. And often those are not the gifted students at all. Gifted students are not typically those front of this class students, although sometimes they are. Um, they tend to be our zanier students who approach the world in a completely unique manner. This is important for district leadership to know as they're thinking about who is actually in their program and who's being served. It's also important to know because you want to share this information with your general education teachers if students are not referred, then they can't be identified, and we want to make sure that our referrals are based on characteristics and best practices and not our assumptions about gifted learners. Now we're going to talk about gifted students and, and academics because we know that although they are gifted and they're served by the gifted program, they spend most of their time in the academic setting, which is where they should be. So gifted students in grades two through eight may not be required to make up classwork missed when they are scheduled to be in the gifted classroom. Often gifted children can meet academic standards early. They don't need a lot of repetition. And so having them miss class is, does not have a negative effect on their progress. So it can be really disheartening for a gifted student to come back from gifted to a stack of classwork that they've already proven that they've learned. So it's really important to work with, with t classroom teachers so that they, they know that gifted children are going to gifted because it's a service that they need and it's not something that they should be um, punished for by um, by having, you know, double the homework on gifted day or anything like that. You really want to, in creating policies and practices within your district, you really want to address that as, as you can. It is not reasonable to accept, expect gifted students by the virtue of having grant, granted gifted eligibility that they are academically advanced. A lot of our gifted students are academically successful, but some of them are. And like I mentioned before, it really is based on how the brain develops, and you want students to be served as individuals as possible. So you want to make sure that your expectations are based on the student and what the student has shown and not just on the fact that they are eligibility eligible for gifted services. gifted education program requirements. We're going to start by talking about our number one requirement, which is actually criterion one, standard one in our standards document. And that is our programs are required to offer a qualitatively different learning experience to gifted children that is designed to meet the specific needs of gifted learners. Often gifted programs look and feel different and to people who don't work inside them it, you really can wonder what's happening and what kind of learning is happening but the truth is gifted programs are supposed to look and feel different because it is a, a different setting for gifted children. Identified gifted children who are eligible for services must be served for 240 minutes each week, which is 44 hours, excuse me, not 40 hours. Um, that is what is required by our, our standards and regulations. 300 minutes is recommended, and for districts who are hoping to document that they have an excellent or exemplary gifted program, um, then they must document that students are receiving 300 minutes of instructional time. Most of our districts, if they don't serve students for the 300 minutes or five hours, they actually try to be between those two times, between four and five hours, so that they guarantee that gifted children are getting their minimum amount of time and there's no question about the scheduling. 
Gifted teachers, teachers of the gifted program must hold gifted endorsement. We're going to talk about that more when we talk about MSIS and how that connects to how district um, re- districts receive their funding. And the gifted program is supposed to have personalized instruction based on student interest that's designed to meet the needs of gifted students. Gifted is required to be offered in a resource room as a pullout program with a class size that is recommended from 8 to 12 students. So districts have some flexibility in this. We don't question anything when we come to monitor in classes up to um, 15 gifted students per class. Now, this obviously is going to be guided by the classroom space that's available um, and the, um, the schedule as it is constructed. Anything above 15, we ask districts to justify um, because 12 students times five days or five classes a day is 60 students, and that is the max number that teachers are allowed to serve. So this is a recommendation. There is some flexibility, but the important thing to note here is our last bullet, which says local districts have flexibility in the operation of programs. But general education class size, as mandated in the accreditation standards, is inappropriate for gifted classes. At all times, the integrity of the program must be maintained. And that's the most important thing to remember about this, is as you're scheduling gifted teachers and gifted classes, the integrity of the gifted program must be maintained so that students are getting the service that they are guaranteed. Gifted programs are guided by our own curriculum that is the Outcomes for Gifted Education Programs 2017. This was updated just last year. It covers thinking skills, which is critical thinking, creativity, information literacy, which is not only research, but how to get information and how to um, process and learn from the information you're gathering. Success skills and effective skills, which address the social and emotional supports that gifted children need, and communication skills. Some gifted children are great communicators, and others really have to be taught how to communicate in a way that um, other people can hear and understand what they're trying to say. These out- the outcomes are available online at, um, at the NTE's website, and they are based on best practices in gifted education, and they are aligned with our college and career ready standards. So that's an important thing to know that that as you are looking into what your gifted teachers are teaching in their classrooms, that this is the document that should guide them. Gifted programs should not be more of the same from the classroom. They should not be activity books and worksheets or one style of teaching and learning. Remember the most important standard, our first standard, is that it is a qualitatively different learning experience designed to meet the needs of gifted children. So because of that, it, gifted programs should focus on the developmental needs of gifted learners and the complex complex issues, problem solving, critical thinking. Gifted children, the, the purpose of the gifted program is not for gifted children to gain more knowledge. It is that they can take the knowledge that they have and solve problems and, and find more information and, and sort of create this cycle of learning. Um, but it's not, the, the purpose of it is not, you know, a sentence that ends with a period. The purpose of our program is definitely something that ends with, you know, dot, dot, dot. What, what is coming next? Gifted programs should base learning on student interests with student input and really aid students in understanding themselves and giftedness. Being gifted is is very complex, much like any other kind of learning need. And so it's really important that students understand how being gifted affects who they are and who they will become so that they can be their most successful. Now we're going to talk about MSIS data entry. This is really important because it is the key to gifted funding and gifted teacher unit funding. So the gifted course code that for intellectually gifted uh, programs is 662001. It is important to know that that we fund only intellectually gifted programs in grades second through sixth grade. And the way that we fund that is through teacher units. So to have students show up so that you can be funded for your appropriate number of teacher units. The student has to be marked as gifted within the package, and they have to be scheduled with a gifted teacher 
um, who has gifted endorsement. And also that 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 teacher schedule should reflect 330 minutes within the gifted education program. If any of these data points is incorrect, the district may lose funding for gifted education teacher units, which is included in the MAUP lump sum. So how do we calculate those units? Well, it's actually designed for flexibility. Every student in the gift in the district, every gifted student in the district is counted, and teachers are funded on a 40 plus 1 calculation. Now, the first teacher unit is funded when the district has 20 students, and the second teacher unit is funded when the district has 41 teacher te uh, gifted students. Then from then on from from that point forward, Teacher units are funded on the 40 plus 1 calculation. So when the district gets to 82 students, gifted, identified gifted students, then they're funded for three gifted teacher units, um, and so on and so forth. If you have questions about this, you can contact me. It is a little more complicated than I want to get into in this particular session. What you need to know, though, is that gifted teachers are funded on a 40 plus 1 calculation, but that gifted students may serve up to 60 students a year. So that is where the district has flexibility because we fund at 41, but you have a 19 student swing so that you're um, the number of gifted teachers you have meets the needs of the students within the district. It is important to know that if the district's gifted teacher to student ratio is greater than 1 to 60, or at any point during the year that any teacher has more than 60 students on roll, the district would be in noncompliance with accreditation, seven, accreditation standard 17.8. So as you're planning for the year, you want to make sure that gifted students get the time that they're required, that they're being served by a teacher who is endorsed in gifted education, and that that teacher is not serving more than 60 students per year. That is the end of our session for today. Um, if you have any, any questions at all based on what's been presented here, please don't hesitate to contact me. Again, I'm Jen Cornett. I am the Gifted Education Specialist, and my email address is jcornett at mdek12.org, and our office number is 601-359-2586. Thank you so much.